It's the 1970s, and a Russian school inspector was questioning the children. He points to one of the boys and says, who's your father? The boy replies, the Soviet Union. Then he asks, and who's your mother? The Communist Party, came the reply. And what do you want to be when you grow up? He said, I want to be a worker for the glory of the state and the party. The inspector then pointed to one of the girls and asks, and who's your father? The girl answered, the Soviet Union. And who's your mother? The Communist Party. And what do you want to be when you grow up? The inspector asked the girl. A heroine of the Soviet Union, she said, raising lots of children for the state and the party. The inspector looked around the room and he spotted a Jewish boy off in the corner trying to look inconspicuous. He points to the boy and says, what's your name? The boy replies, Mendel Abramovich. Who's your father? The Soviet Union. And who's your mother? The Communist Party, he said. And what do you want to be when you grow up? Asked the inspector. And Mendel replied, an orphan. There's obviously nothing funny about the situation in Ukraine. It's tragic and scary. Like many of you, I've been following the events as they've unfolded. And amidst the sorrow and the heartbreak, I also feel inspired and full of pride as I witness Ukraine's Vladimir Zelensky stand up to Vladimir Putin. A former actor, Zelensky, is putting on the performance of a lifetime, and it may cost him his life. When asked by the West if he wanted to escape to save his life, he famously said, I need ammunition, not a ride. Now, such a response was not a given. It was not obvious for at least three reasons. First, romantic visions aside, the captain doesn't always go down with the ship. When Germany invaded France in World War II, Charles de Gaulle fled to London. Or take a more recent example, when Afghanistan was falling to the Taliban, President Ashraf Ghani boarded a helicopter out of Kabul. And who could blame them if caught Zelensky faces certain death? Second, giving up the opportunity to escape was not an obvious choice for Zelensky himself. By now, you probably know his story. Zelensky began his career as a comedian in the style of Benny Hill. He started with and starred in a show appropriately called Servant of the People. Zelensky and a group of friends, they built a comedy troupe that became one of the most beloved acts in the post-Soviet world. In the process, he built an entertainment empire in Russia. He could have remained successful in that sphere. He could have continued to make jokes rather than make decisions about the fate of his nation. But in 2014, after Putin invaded the country of his birth, Zelensky donated money to the Ukrainian army. And that put him on the wrong side of the Russian government. From that point on, he used the stage as a platform to chart a new course for his emerging democracy. An actor as a president, an actor who just a few years ago was dancing with the stars, he could have just as easily exited stage left. Third, Zelensky's, I don't need a ride, it was not a given because he's a Jew. Let me remind you of some of Ukraine's history. This was the Pale of Settlements. This was the location of the fictional Anitevka from Fiddler on the Roof. You remember those scenes in Fiddlers of the brutal pogroms that left Jews fleeing? Well, that continued in even more brutal fashion during World War II. Over the course of two days in 1941, 33,000 Jews were murdered at Babinyar making it one of the deadliest Holocaust massacres. That a Jewish president is now standing with and standing for Ukraine, that's remarkable. And that his Judaism is inconsequential to the Ukrainians is even more remarkable. It's a turning point for the history of the Jews of Ukraine. Given the history, given the neo-Nazi far-right group, 
Zelensky would have been justified to turn his back, but he's staying put. Rather than use his privilege or his position to save himself, Zelensky is standing with his fellow countrymen. In his refusal to abandon them, he showed us what leadership is, what heroism is, what conscious looks like. In the words of Franklin Foyer, a columnist for The Atlantic, it's hard to think of another recent instant in which one human being has defied the collective expectations for his behavior and provided such an inspiring moment of service to the people, clarifying the terms of the conflict through his example. Now, it may be hard to think of another recent instance, but as Jews yearly, we encounter such an example in the book of Esther. Let me remind you of the scene on which the entire book turns. The Jews, they're threatened with annihilation. Haman has the power and the resources to destroy the people, but there is a glimmer of hope. Esther can reverse the madness of this moment. But the truth is, she's no Zelensky. She's afraid. When Mordecai tells her, go to the king and ask him to reverse the decree against the Jews, Esther responds, who, me? I can't do it. You can't just barge in and see the king. If you haven't been given an audience with the king, you're forbidden from entering. Desperate and audacious, Mordecai challenges her, saying, do not imagine that you can escape with your life. You think that you'll be protected here in the king's palace, but you too will be killed. In other words, Mordecai is saying, don't think that you can escape, that you can escape the palace, nor can you escape being a Jew. If you don't act, if you don't take a risk and approach the king, you will surely suffer the same fate. And with that, it clicks. Esther gets it. She knows that this moment, it depends on her. The fate of her people rests on her shoulders. So she tells Mordecai, go gather up all of the Jews in Shushan, have them fast and pray for salvation. And here's the key phrase. Though it is against the law, Esther says, I will go to the king, and if I perish, I perish. Avadati, avadati. We see in this Zelensky moment, a leader willing to risk her life to save her people. She says to herself, she says to Mordecai, she says to the Jews, I can't turn my back on my people. They need me. The Hebrew, Hebrew captures what is at stake, avadati, Kasher avadati, avadati. The doubling of the verb is there for emphasis. If I die, then I die. But we can also understand it to mean avadati. If the king disapproves of me violating the law, then I'll be put to death. At the same time, avadati. If I do nothing and my people perish, I will surely die a spiritual death as well. Now, admittedly, Esther's bravery didn't come easily or instantly. She had to be convinced by Mordecai of her role and her responsibility. But once convinced, she became a servant of the people, prepared to sacrifice herself for the sake of her nation. Misirat nefesh, self-sacrifice. Now, I, I realize it's not such a popular notion, Sure, we admire people who, like soldiers or police, who literally put their lives on the line. And when they do pay the highest price, we valorize them. We look up to them, we call them heroes. At the same time, we say, yeah, but, but I could never do that. Well, of course we could. Maybe not quite on that same level, all of us. But many people exemplify self-sacrifice all the time. If you've raised children, if you've cared for a sick spouse or a friend, if you've been there for a parent as they've aged, you know from Misirat Nefesh, and you know that it's not about courage, 
It's about commitment. It's not about bravery. It's an expression of love, so much so that you don't really experience it as giving up, but rather giving to. Underlying this kind of selflessness are three fundamental tenets. First, my people, they matter. They have to survive. This cause, it matters. It has to succeed. Number two, this thing is bigger than just me. The group doesn't exist to fulfill my needs. I'm part of something larger, and I'm called upon to do my part. Third, I can make a difference. What I do, it matters. If I live by these three principles, then I will do whatever I can to ensure the survival of my people, to guarantee the success of my mission, to safeguard the well-being of my family, of my community and friends. Even if it's hard, even if it's inconvenient, even if it comes at a cost, because that's what it means to live my values. That's what it means to be a person of conscience, a person of conviction and honor. And that's what we see in Esther and in Zelensky. They put others before themselves. In our me first, uh, my way or the highway world, that makes them heroes in my book. And they're exactly what our nation and what our community needs. A willingness of ordinary people, you and me, to look beyond our own wants and needs, even, actually, especially when it's hard and to do for others. We need more Esthers, we need more Zelenskys. Now, I'm not asking you for that ultimate level of sacrifice, but both of them, they inspire us to ask, ask not what your shul can do for you, but what you can do for your shul. Both of us challenge us by asking, what can I do to ensure the survival of my people, my community, my nation? We know the list. Give of your time, your energy, your dollars. Volunteer in schools, in social service organizations. Participate actively and civilly in civic life. Support causes that are needed that make a difference. Build strong families. All of these are good and important. When it comes to ensuring the survival of the Jewish people, what does it take? Mitzvot, celebrating Shabbos, keeping kosher, learning Hebrew, daving in a minion, studying Torah, sending kids to Jewish school and Jewish camp, making Aliyah, becoming a rabbi, a cantor, a Jewish professional, and much, much more. Now, listen, I realize that making Kiddush or avoiding those shrimp, practicing Aleph, Bet, Bet, it might not sound particularly heroic, but they're huge. For some people, making a change in their diet, a change in what they do on Friday nights, how they spend their time, that's no small thing. These things might not feel like an Esther act of courage, but they certainly are a sign of commitment. And believe me when I say, they will strengthen Am Yisrael, the Jewish people. They'll strengthen our community at a time when we desperately need it. Each of us can make a difference. That is the enduring message of Purim. About Mordechai, the Megillah concludes he was Godol. He was great. What was his greatness? What made him such a hero? He was, to use the title of Zelensky's early comedy show, A Servant of the People. We read in the book's very last verse, Mordechai was doresh tov la'amo. He sought out, he demanded the best for his people. Not for himself, but for his people. Specific, specifically, the dover shalom. He promoted peace and welfare for future descendants. 
Chavirim, we're not supposed to simply dress up like Esther and Mordechai. We are to become them. In the words of the conservative movement's brand new commentary on the Megillah, the destiny of Israel is ultimately the responsibility of every single Jewish soul. That is the Megillah's ultimate lesson and its most profound point.